If you were stranded in a remote frozen cabin, handcuffed to your spouse's dead body with murderous intruders at the front door, what would you do? I'm going to break down the mistakes made by our stranded widow, see if we can make better choices and ultimately attempt to beat the intruders in it till death. Nobody said the death of a relationship was going to be easy. It's especially tough when you're married to a narcissistic defense attorney with the power to sick your former attacker on you. Why go through all the trouble of just divorcing your partner like a healthy person when you can arrange to have both your spouse and their lover killed in the most poetic of ways by the person they fear the most. Emma felt trapped in her marriage long before Mark ensnared her in a complicated murder-suicide arrangement. Now, she'll have to survive a few of the coldest, scariest, and grossest hours of her life to separate herself from him. Literally. Let's find out if we can beat this situation better than Emma can. The movie begins with Emma breaking up with her side guy, Tom, as she's leaving for an anniversary trip with her husband, Mark, a defense attorney who sold out to the dark side. Emma arrives at her husband's office to find a conspicuously placed police report on his desk. Inside, there's a photograph of Emma beaten after an attempted mugging turned violent, causing her to have PTSD flashbacks of her attacker, Bobby Ray, stabbing her in the back. She survived by blinding Bobby in one eye with her keys. He then went to prison for 10 years. Mark eases her concerns, saying that Bobby was out on parole, but it's been revoked and the police are trying to find him. Look, I'm not here to provide merit counseling. That said, if you value your life and property, it's statistically not in your best interest to go behind your partner's back. In the U.S., 13% of homicide cases are committed by family members, and a full quarter of those are wives who were OJ'd by their husbands. I'm actually surprised it's not higher considering the divorce rate in this country. If you manage to keep your head attached to your body, you needlessly sicked money and property disputes on yourself. I'll go ahead and say this too. If you're married to a smart, calculated, morally destitute, if I don't win, nobody wins type of guy like me Mark, who has connections with murder for hires, you need to be really careful. Diamond necklaces bought with blood are non-returnable. Emma can't undo Tom. So in order to climb out of the grave she dug, she needs to understand the warning signs before a domestic violence event occurs. The warning sign here, of course, is the court file Emma finds in Mark's office. Mark clearly left this out for her to see when she arrived. As a defense attorney, he knows a lot of bad guys, and unnecessarily leaving this plainly on his desk on their anniversary for her to find is chilling. I'd wager he knew about the affair, and judging by his eerily calm demeanor, it's going to be Rose petals in and blood trails going out. Is it better to slap him with a divorce on the anniversary or after it? I'd say at the anniversary dinner since it's public. You get an amazing meal out of it and since there won't be an after anniversary. We see no physical marks on Emma, so it's likely Mark isn't physically abusive, though she does wear a ton of makeup. It's likely Mark would contest a divorce if Emma asked for it, and as a lawyer, he knows how to make the process difficult for her. But with a divorce petition on record, she at least physically separate herself from him post a dinner and excuse herself for many planned activities in areas with no witnesses. Let's see if Emma serves him before he can become her old ball and chain. Bobby and Jimmy look like they could have freshened themselves up with cologne by ordering this video sponsor, Scentbird. Scentbird is a fragrance subscription service for men and women with over 600 designer and indie brands like Prada, Gucci, Versace, Vince Camuto, and more in the US and Canada. It's convenient and affordable. You choose a new fragrance to try every month for a 30 day supply so you can check out fragrances before committing to a full bottle. Each Scentbird vial has eight times more than a regular sample that will last a full month. Discover new fragrances by taking a simple quiz. Based on your preferences, previous purchases, and quiz answers, you'll be matched to fragrances tailored just for you. Scentbird is a flexible subscription so you can skip any month without penalties, and it's a perfect gift for anyone. Each sample comes in a fitted felt bag, in a case that you twist to spray, and you get a card that provides a description of the scent and the different notes you'll smell. For this month, my two favorites are the Raw Spirit Winter Oak and the Hugo Boss Bottled Infinite. I enjoy the fresh, earthy, and cozy feels of these. I also got Scents of Wood, Lame du Bois Vetiver in Oak, of which I enjoy the scent of woodiness, but with a hint of spice. Dolce & Gabbana, Poor Home. I like this one for a classy night out. And Sue Phillips House of Fragrance Woodsy Blend, which I like the herbaceousness of. Head to Scentbird.com, pick your favorite scents, or take the quiz and make sure you 
use my code NERD55 at checkout to get 55% off your first month at Scentbird. At dinner, Mark presents her with a steel necklace that looks like a chain. When it's Emma's turn to give him a gift, she presents him with two Super Bowl tickets, which he rudely dismisses and ultimately leaves as a tip for the waitstaff. Outside, Mark tells her he has one more gift for her, and she finds a blindfold in her coat pocket. She reluctantly gets in, and Mark secretly drives them into the boonies of upstate New York. On the way, Emma starts to feel carsick and tries to remove the blindfold, but Mark grabs her arm and forces her to keep it on. Emma, your dark triad husband is onto your Ashley Madison monkey branching. Dumping your Super Bowl tickets is yet another sign he's not interested in turning over a new leaf. You're not a Jedi, Daredevil, or Ricky Bobby, so why are you black bagging yourself in Mark's SUV? Blindfolds are for billionaires' mistresses, or couples who completely trust each other, and Emma clearly does not trust Mark. I'd make any excuse to not wear it, and refuse to get into his car if he demanded it. It's one thing to brave an awkward drive home where you can serve him papers in the next morning. It's a whole other thing to be a willing participant in Mark's premeditated tragedy. We know Mark's up to something because he wanted to blindfold her in the first place, and based on the evidence so far, it's nothing good. It'd be best to not follow his breadcrumbs and have a friend, or Tom if she's a savage, pick us up to stay with for the night. At the very least, she should excuse herself to the bathroom to set up a Find My Friends Locator app to share her real-time location with friends, let them know she's suspicious of Mark, and to have them call the police if they don't hear from her in the next morning. Then again, if you're this suspicious, don't even get in the car in the first place. At the point when Mark physically stops her from taking her blindfold off, I'd be ripping that thing off and thumbing 911 unless he 180'd the car immediately. Of course, he could just bang her head off the dash and improvise his twisted take on Romeo and Juliet anyways. Emma naively got into the car, and now she's at the edge of the grave she dug with Mark standing behind her. After an hour-long drive, they arrive at their lake house. Inside, Emma is made to count to ten wearing the blindfold. When she takes it off, she wanders through a huge romantic fire hazard of burning candles and rose petals to the master bedroom where Mark is waiting with a bottle of champagne. The next morning, Emma wakes to find herself cold in bed, handcuffed to Mark. Mark puts a gun to his temple, tells her it's time to wake up, and pulls the trigger, splattering her in his blood. Okay, the glass half full is that he didn't blow our brains out, or smother us with a pillow, so there's that. I do appreciate the nuanced angling of his revolver, far enough that we didn't get hit by the bullet exiting his skull close enough that the blood brain soup could spray all over us. It's not what I'd pour my formerly intact brain power into figuring out, but Mark was facing big bar time for his shading dealings, and opted for the easy way out. Once composure is regained, we need to put the puzzle pieces together and figure out what the hell is going on. This isn't Mark just having a bad morning. One, he obviously knew about her affair with Tom. Two, he flaunted Bobby Ray's case file in her face on her anniversary. Three, he took her to a remote location. Four, he chained himself to her before cracking his egg open. Five, he left her alive for now. Six, Bobby Ray's on the loose. First guess, he wants to take us down with him and make us suffer along the way. What does that mean specifically though? What's the end goal look like exactly? We can cross framing us for his murder off the list because there's an abundance of evidence that Mark set this nightmare up. Second possibility is that he wants us to freeze or starve to death by being stuck in a remote, unheated home, unable to trudge home with his corpse latched to us. This doesn't make much sense since someone would have noticed we were missing fairly quickly and come to Mark's lake house to check if we were there. The most plausible scenario is that Bobby Ray is on his way to exact his own revenge. Since we have a history with him, Mark flaunted his case file in our face, there's no witnesses out here, and Bobby hadn't been picked up by police yet. Tom may be in trouble too. The first order of business is to attempt to call for help with a bedstand phone, and to warn Tom without unintentionally baiting him to the lake house where he may be ambushed too. There's no way the phone's actually gonna work though. Emma tries the phone, and yep, as expected, Mark set us up for failure. Being able to call for help would be too easy. I'm gonna guess that our iPhones are trashed as well. We can't just chill here and wait for the cops to show up in a day or so, because if Bobby is on the way, we need to be able to move, hide, and run. In order to do that, we need to get rid of the dead weight. The seemingly obvious thing to try first is shooting the handcuff off, though it's not likely to break the chain the way she's holding it. There isn't enough tension in the chain, and the bolt is likely to nick the chain in passing or bend the cuffs rather than shatter them. Even if she had a shotgun, the blast might not shatter the links. It would be better to press the gun flush with Mark's hand and shoot his thumb 
come off. However, I'd be conscious of saving whatever ammo was left for any other surprises Mark has in store for us, and removing his hand or hand cuff manually. Of course, this is all assuming Mark left any ammo in the gun, which there's no way he did. Emma points the gun at the handcuff chain, starts squeezing the trigger, and as expected again, the revolver is empty. We could search the kitchen for some serrated knives, but again, Mark definitely removed all the sharp objects, and we probably don't have the time and energy to drag him around on a fool's errand. Emma's remaining options are either pick the cuffs or mangle Mark's hand. If Emma could find a thin, flat piece of metal that could fit between the teeth of the cuff and the internal lock mechanism, she could potentially pick the cuff off. She could also insert a paper clip into the keyhole and bend it slightly, then use that to lift the mechanism inside and free herself. Here, we can see that Mark's metal suspender clips look relatively narrow and flat. While the clip itself is probably too wide to use, the small metal circle that attaches the clip to the fabric could be small enough to fit. While we'll learn that Mark has cleared the house of seemingly everything that could help her, in this shot, we can see that the shelves have some objects on them, so Emma should take a look in drawers just in case she can find something to pick the lock. There is a third option here, and that's using something heavy to turn Mark's hand into mush. If the Saw franchise taught me anything, it's that there's a lot of ways to mangle a hand. At the end of the day, the CMC joint and the trapezium bone near the thumb are technically the only things keeping her tethered to him. The foot of a wooden table or toilet tank lid repeatedly applied with enough force can do the same work as a hammer, allowing her to slip the cuffs off of his shattered hand. Emma decides to create a makeshift drag stretcher with her wedding gown to haul his body downstairs in search of the elusive sharp tools. She pulls too hard, the body slides forward, and tosses them both down the stairs. Hauling dead meat around is hard work, especially if you weigh 120 pounds and the guy you're dragging weighs 160. That said, the gown isn't going to make it much easier dragging him over hardwood than his clothing already does. She would have been far, far better off flattening his hand with a vase and ditching him altogether. It goes without saying that her stairway descent could have been executed with more grace. Grabbing him under the arms and getting into a solid brace position would have given her more control. At the bottom of the stairs, Emma discovers the front door she locked the night before is wide open, filling the house with winter chill. The winter wasteland outside looks vast and deadly. Emma shuts the door and discovers that during the night, Mark tossed her phone into a vase of water. She tries to turn it on, but it malfunctions. So she begins searching through the kitchen cabinets for more sharp tools, and yet again, as expected, everything's been removed. Just because the kitchen cabinets have all been empty doesn't mean the rest of the house has been. Mark was definitely thorough clearing out the cabin, but Emma is one forgotten safety pin, tack, or paperclip away from freedom. If she just has a look around the shelves of the house, she could even try breaking one of these metal hanging picture frames and pick the lock with that. As for the phone, well, a quick rub on the shoulder isn't going to dry anything. If there's no rice to dry it, which there probably isn't, she should try to find paper or cloth and let it sit long enough to dry fully before trying to turn it on. Emma searches the trash can next and finds Mark's car keys. <laughs> okay. Is it stupid to even try the car at this point? Obviously, Mark will have slashed the tires, killed the battery, or drained it of gas. Yeah, we're gonna feel pretty dumb even trying it, knowing that Mark's playing us at every turn, but how dumb would we look if the car actually did work and we didn't try it before the cops found us days later? Pretty damn dumb. However, I don't think time is on our side, so she needs to focus on stomping Mark's hand into a pulp to free herself first, and keeping a lookout for any uninvited visitors on the main road. Emma puts on Mark's pants and tears part of her wedding dress off to fashion shoes for herself before dragging Mark across the snowy yard and around the house to the garage. Making shoes of any kind is smart thinking especially in winter weather like this. While it might not seem important in the grand scheme of things, frostbite can set in in as little as 15 minutes. When the weather is this cold and there's a little bit of wind, an exhausting manual work like lugging a dead body around is going to make her sweat, which will drastically increase her risk of hypothermia. Emma's going to be losing some toes in this divorce if she doesn't find better protection. She needs to close the cabin off, restore the heat if Mark hasn't tampered with it, which he probably did, and find better shoes and clothes. Most wedding dresses are made out of warm warm weather materials like silk and chiffon, so they're only going to last her so long. If she had thought about it before coming downstairs, she could have used the bed sheets and pillowcases to fashion warmer shoes. Of course, she didn't know she'd have to haul Mark's body around the frozen yard like a sack of concrete, so that's understandable. However, we can see that she has 
one other option in the living room. If she can find something like a pen to cut the leather from this chair, it'd give her better protection from the cold. Emma hauls him into their SUV. The SUV starts when she cranks the key, but putters out quickly. As expected, Marky Mark siphoned out all the gas. Hey, at least we won't look like morons when the cops show up. They do have a small boat engine, which uses the same type of gas that cars do. While it's cold as hell out, gas only freezes at negative 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And even though gas degrades over time when left out, if it's even a year or two old, it might still work to push the car down the road to town. If the gas is too stale, I'd just find a good hiding spot, keeping an eye on the main road and wait for help to arrive. It's too cold to walk, and if Bobby is on the way in and spots us, we're dead. Emma hauls Mark's corpse back into the house and heads for the basement, only to discover Mark has also taken all the tools from the workshop. Emma hauls Mark to the dark room to also discover that Mark switched out their happy wedding photos for proof of her infidelity with Tom. He also hung up a massive photo of her attacker, Bobby Ray, and she finds the play me sign now sitting on a cassette recorder. When she presses play, we hear the police interview of her recounting Bobby Ray's attack. Seeing the poster of Bobby Ray and hearing the recording of her police statement should light a fire under Emma to detach his hand as soon as possible. There is no way Bobby isn't part of this divorce. Emma hears a car pull up outside. She locks the door quickly, but she opens the gap when she hears Tom is there. Tom explains that he got a message from her saying she screwed up and needs his help. Emma opens the door, revealing Mark's dead body. She quickly explains that he cuffed himself to her and shot himself in the head. Emma tells Tom to call the cops, but Tom wants to wait until they can manage their stories. Emma is quick to remind him that given how much Mark hated both of them, Mark did not send the SOS message to Tom so that Tom could come rescue her. She tells him again to call the cops. Tom tells her he left his phone in the car charger. When they open the door, they see a pickup truck slowly driving towards the house, a car Tom saw parked off the road about a mile away. Emma says they need to run, but Tom goes outside to confront whoever is coming and tells her to lock the door behind him. Tom is wasting time worrying about calling the police. At minimum, they need to drag Mark's body to Tom's car and drive away. Emma can fill him in on the road. While there is technically a way for he and Emma to be charged with contributing to Mark's suicide, it's unlikely as they didn't encourage Mark to kill himself. The district attorney would have to go out of their way to not see that Mark premeditated his own revenge against them. The hose in the car should have Tom's fingerprints on it, as should the photos in the cassette recorder. The warrant out for Mark's arrest would also add context. Washing Mark's blood off of her face would not negate forensic evidence either. Wound ballistics would show that Mark fired the gun himself. The angle of the bullet, as well as the contact wound charring on his forehead, as well as the blood splatter patterns on her neck and on the wall behind the bed, would place her in the bed beside him when he fired the gun. And while gunshot residue would have drifted onto Emma in the bed, Mark's hand would be caked in a much higher concentration of it. The marks on her wrist showing her trying to get the cuff off and her dragging him around the house, leaving trails of blood, suggest struggle like she doesn't have the key. It feels like it would be a massive leap to suggest that she would handcuff herself to someone she killed. Tom is also way too casual about whoever is in the truck. It's the dead of winter. Who would be visiting? It's clearly not a police car approaching and I don't know about you, but I've closed doors in faces of school children and Bible salesmen. Tom should be inside where he can act like he belongs and can tell them to go away with the safety of the door. If anything, Tom should rush to grab his phone and retreat inside, where they can chain and potentially barricade the door, and then answer the visitor's questions safely. That way, once they realize who is outside the door, they can barricade themselves in an upstairs room and call the police. The visitor approaches with a bag, claiming Mark called him to the house to fix a burst pipe. Tom pays the guy to leave, but he asks to use his facilities, saying he's driven all the way from Buffalo. When Tom refuses, the man asks if he has a problem with him, and Tom points out that Buffalo is 250 miles away, a pretty long distance to drive to fix a burst pipe, especially considering the truck has Indiana tags. The moment Tom says this, the truck turns off and a second man steps out. It's Bobby Ray, Emma's attacker. And the first stooge is Bobby's brother, Jimmy. Jimmy tries to stop him, but Bobby stabs Tom repeatedly in the gut with a knife and then kicks the door in. Tom has great spidey senses when it comes to noticing inconspicuous clues like Jimmy's Indiana license plate, but he's terrible at reading Bobby language. It takes Bobby nearly 20 seconds to walk from the truck to the porch, more than enough time for Tom to tell them to back off and retreat behind the cabin door. It's also long enough for Tom to recognize that Bobby is approaching with purpose and aggression. Jimmy turns to Bobby nervously. His energy suggests that he's also afraid of what Bobby's involvement means. Jimmy also tries to physically distract and stop Bobby's approach. These are warning signs of conflict and Tom is now outnumbered. Retreating inside is the smartest first step to make 
here. Inside, Emma should be listening to the conversation when she hears Tom tell Jimmy that he knows he's lying. She should either open the door and yank Tom in, which is risky, or start dragging Mark's body away. By this point, she should already have crushed Mark's hand off and gotten rid of him, but with two aggressive men outside and still tethered to his corpse, she needs to use all the lead time she can get. As Emma hides behind the counter, Bobby takes Tom's car keys and goes upstairs, where he finds the bloody wedding dress and the closet safe. Jimmy notices a blood trail on the floor and follows it to the back door, narrowly missing Emma as she drags Mark's body behind the locked doghouse. Emma enters through the boat slip and finds an anchor. She uses the edge to hack Mark's thumb off and take off the cuff. She ducks under a blanket as Jimmy pulls the locked door open and finds Mark's mutilated body. He runs out to get Bobby and by the time they arrive to investigate, Emma has hidden under the dock. Shivering and terrified, she overhears them say that they're here for the safe. Bobby tells Jimmy that only two people had the combination and one of them is dead. Heading to the boathouse was a risky move, exposing her to the cold and leaving drag marks in the snow for the intruders to follow. But at least she found a sharp object she could use to hack off Mark's hand. There really wasn't anything that she could have done differently here. She likely would not have had enough time to run anywhere else before Jimmy and Bobby returned. It was just sheer luck that they didn't look around more closely. When Bobby and Jimmy return to the house, Emma rewraps her feet in fresh torn wedding dress and tries to drag an old can of gas to the garage. When Jimmy emerges from the house, she hides in plain sight in the snow. When he disappears into the doghouse again, Emma finally makes it to the garage. I'm not sure slowly hauling gas across wide open expanses is such a good idea. Emma only survived this because Jimmy has splinter cell bad guy peripheral vision. This gas canister looks like it holds about 12 gallons. At just over 6 pounds per gallon of gas, if it's full, it would weigh approximately 72 pounds. There's no way for a 120 pound woman with little muscle definition to carry it. At least, not in a timely manner. If we were intent on risking this option, dumping all but the few gallons needed to make it to a neighboring house or town would massively reduce the weight, enabling us to carry it over the snow far more quickly. Like we mentioned earlier, even though regular gas has a shelf life of three to six months before it degrades, if it was refilled in the past year or two, there's a decent chance it'll still work. The other option, if she knows that they have not been to the cabin in many years, is to run to Tom's car and see if it's unlocked. If it is, we could duck inside and call 911 long before Bobby and Jimmy would think to look for us there. Modern cars like the Cadillac that Tom drove have auto-locking doors, so there's a good chance this doesn't work. It looks like Bobby's driving a 95 Ford F-250 Super Cab, so not only might it be unlocked, we could hotwire it. We just need to remove the plastic cover under the steering column, pull the battery and starter wire bundle out, strip the insulation off with a broken piece of plastic, tie the red power wires together, then touch the brown starter wires together. Boom, gone in 60 seconds. Before Emma can fill the tank with gas, Bobby enters the garage. He pulls out the siphon hose and slits the SUV's tires while unknowingly playing Ring Around the Rosie with Emma. It's bad luck that Bobby enters the garage before she can finish refueling. Had that not happened, it's likely she could have escaped right there by backing through the door and speeding away before Bobby and Jimmy could arrive. Even if they did, she could just run them over. Emma is forced to take shelter in the house's basement, where she becomes trapped between the two men. With seconds to spare before she's discovered, she pulls her SUV fob out and sounds her alarm, drawing Bobby and Jimmy away. She takes a moment to mourn Tom as the men disarm the alarm. Retreating to the basement was a massive risk that ultimately trapped her between two potential threats. Instead, it might have been clever to open the basement door to make it look like she went back in the house, then hide around the side of the garage and re-enter after Bobby went into the basement. Now that he's checked it, he's likely to look elsewhere before checking the garage again. Using the car alarm to draw them away was a solid choice, but instead of wasting precious moments mourning Tom, Emma needs to strip him of his coat, shoes, and socks, and then look for a proper hiding spot and a weapon. Or she needs to bundle in Tom's clothes and start walking. It's likely that if they spent time in this cabin over the years, that Emma would know the relative location of the nearest house or town. Protected by Tom's shoes, socks, and coat, Emma could attempt the trek. While she might get hypothermia and probably already has it, the reality is her house is half frozen anyways and hypothermia can happen indoors in as little as 15 minutes at frigid temperatures. Jimmy tells Bobby that they should just leave, but Bobby tells him the diamonds in the safe are compensation for his time in prison and the only reason the car alarm went off was because they were inches from discovering Emma, meaning she's still inside the house somewhere. The men return to the house to find that Emma has removed Tom's shoes. Bobby searches the attic and sees a swaying sheet covered object. When he rips the drop cloth off, Emma emerges from a nearby hiding spot and whacks him across the face with a golf club.
up, knocking him down through the slats in the attic floor onto the second floor where he's knocked unconscious. Emma jumps down and grabs the keys to Tom's car from Bobby. When Jimmy arrives to investigate Bobby's fall, Emma hits him with a golf club too, then locks him in a room by knocking off the doorknob and removing the locking mechanism. Using the golf club to knock Bobby through the ceiling is a great offensive play. It might have done even more damage to stand out of sight as he climbed the ladder and smashed the golf club down on his head. Emma made the classic mistake of momentarily incapacitating her attacker and running while they recovered, when she could have finished the job right then and there. I'd have gone down there and bashed both her brains in with a golf club. The average golf club swing imparts around 8,000 newtons of force on the golf ball. That means a similar force could be imparted on Bobby's head, which would only take 2,300 newtons to crack the skull and about 4,600 newtons to penetrate it. I can confirm this personally, as my head was cracked open by a rogue golf club swing when I was younger. And I'll tell you, your world goes fuzzy and sideways after the first hit, so we would have had plenty of time for follow-up swings. If Bobby didn't fall through the floor, we could have then waited for Jimmy to come up the ladder and done the same to him, or at least use the attic entry as our own personal murder hole like you might find in a medieval castle. Anytime they tried to enter, we could attack them from above. Emma manages to get into Tom's car, but before she can drive away, Bobby appears and breaks the window and opens the door. Emma struggles and manages to call 911 before Bobby yanks her out of the car and tears the battery from the phone. Emma warns Bobby that she doesn't know the safe's combination, but he kicks her unconscious anyways. This is why you finish them when you have the chance. Contrary to what we see in movies, calling 911 on a cell phone does not guarantee that help will come, especially since Emma didn't have time to tell the operator where she was located. With cell phones, it's important to give the 911 operator location details because they can't trace you via landline. And as Bobby rips out the battery five seconds into the call, it's likely the operator would not be able to track the phone signal. Emma wakes handcuffed to Mark's body again. Bobby tells her he knows the safe combination is the date Mark proposed to Emma, but she reasons he'll kill her the second she tells him. When Bobby goes to cut off her toes as an incentive, Jimmy tries to stop him. Bobby knocks him down where he can see Mark's gun under the bed. Jimmy points the gun at Bobby and tells Emma she'll live if she gives him the code. She agrees if he uncuffs her from Mark's body first. Jimmy tucks the gun in the back of his pants to pick the lock on her cuffs. When the cuffs come off, Emma gives them the combination. Bobby drags Mark's body to the safe and unlocks it, but inside, he finds a butcher's cleaver engraved with the message, the diamonds you seek lay close to her heart. Emma tells him the diamonds must be in the necklace Mark gave her, but it doesn't have a clasp and she can't take it off. Jimmy tries a pair of bolt cutters, but it can't break it either. Emma kind of messed up by immediately revealing that the necklace was where the treasure was. She could have tried to misdirect them by insinuating that Mark must have swallowed them or something. Since Jimmy can't cut the chain with bolt cutters, it's likely made of hardened steel. Cutting this off is going to be too time consuming and difficult to do right here. If Jimmy does not want Emma to die, he'd have been better off grabbing the knife and keeping the gun trained on Bobby while walking himself and Emma out to the car and leaving. If I was Emma, I'd have tried to grab the gun out of Jimmy's waistband and done the same. Stowing the gun in his waistband and turning his back on Bobby was dumb because Bobby sneaks up behind Jimmy, grabs the gun, and breaks Jimmy's nose. He points the gun at Emma and fires, but the gun is empty. Emma lunges for Bobby's knife, but Bobby grabs it first. Jimmy rushes to stop Bobby from killing her, but in the fight, Bobby accidentally impales his brother on a wall hook. Bobby blames Emma for Jimmy's death. She tries to keep him away with his own knife, but Bobby stabs her in the leg. She knocks him aside and manages to handcuff him to Mark's body. Again, this is why if you're trapped in a bleak situation like this and you have the chance to kill your attacker, like Emma did when she knocked Bobby through the ceiling with the golf club, you want to take it. At the very least, Emma should use their fight as a chance to flee to another hiding spot. When Emma tried to defend herself with Bobby's knife, she should have used much shorter strikes and slashes to avoid giving Bobby the opportunity to grab and disarm her. Once she disorients him by hitting him across the face with his bolt cutters, she should roll over and cave his face in. Cuffing Bobby to Mark was a good idea, but why not cave his face in as well? Despite Mark's dead weight, Bobby Ray still chases Emma through the house to the garage. She gets in her SUV and gets it to start, but with Bobby coming through the door after her, she goes with the charge first, asks questions later approach, and backs over her husband's body. Unfortunately, she drives backwards so fast, she slams into Tom and Bobby's cars. Emma puts the car in drive and hits 
Bobby again, going through the garage wall. Her SUV skids across the icy yard, obliterating the boathouse. You don't want to let your thirst for revenge be your downfall, and that's exactly what Emma did. Had she focused on driving as far down the road as possible, she'd likely have ended up in a much better situation. There was a lot of snow on the side of the driveway she could have gotten stuck in, and Bobby could have driven after her. At least don't overcommit your attacks. Once he was on the hood, pump the brakes, let him slide off, then accelerate over him again. Rinse and repeat. After she crashes the SUV into the boathouse, she should head for the house instead of the lake's surface. It forces Bobby to haul Mark's body through the snow and up the stairs. Then, she could go check Jimmy for keys or a phone. Hauling Mark's dead body, Bobby chases Emma out onto the frozen lake surface. The ice audibly cracks beneath them as they fight. Bobby stabs with a knife. Emma deflects. Then she grabs the knife and plunges it into his collarbone and kicks him off. The ice breaks and Mark's body goes under, dragging Bobby down with him. Bobby grabs onto Emma's necklace as he slides, dragging her into the frigid water with him. Underwater, Bobby loses the fight when Emma pulls the knife from his collar and stabs out his eye, blinding him. Bobby should have taken the knife out of his own collar and used it on Emma first, just saying. He didn't, which gave Emma her only chance to free herself. As we'll see in a second, pulling the knife back out of his head and holding on to it also saved her life. When she's in the freezing water, Emma has less than 30 minutes to get to a warmer area before clinical hypothermia sets in. However, because she's been freezing all day, it could set in almost immediately. She has moments before her body begins to fail from muscle coordination loss. She does a number of things right here. If you're trapped in icy water, swimming can help keep your body from going into shock, and it can prevent something called sudden disappearance syndrome, in which you're so shocked by the cold water that you involuntarily gasp, inhale water, and drown. Emma rushes to the surface, but she's drifted and is now trapped under the ice. When all hope seems lost, Emma stabs through the two-inch ice with Bobby's knife and punches through, freeing herself. She rolls onto the ice and tosses off her wedding ring just as police sirens ring through the air. Unfortunately, it would take at least 300 to 400 pounds of pressure to break through two-inch ice like this. If you're ever trapped under ice, cutting through the ice is unlikely. It might be too thick or you might be too weak. If you can't punch through, stay calm, steady your thoughts, and don't flail. Turn slowly in a circle with your eyes open and look for shafts of light that could be caused by the hole you fell through. You can also dive a little lower to look for light that way. Chances are, you're screwed though. She must have found a lucky weak point. After breaking through, she does the right thing by laying flat on the ice, which helps to disperse her weight and makes it less likely for her to fall in again. Emma survived thanks to some quick thinking and her superhuman immunity to frostbite, but she could have done better. There were several early ways in which she could have detached herself from Mark's body using household objects like a paper clip or a toilet tank lid. If she had separated herself from Mark earlier, she would have discovered the empty gas tank earlier and probably found the gas canister in the boathouse even before Tom arrived to check on her. If Tom hadn't decided to play an unnecessary hero when Jimmy and Bobby showed up, he would have been able to hide with Emma to avoid getting stabbed. Once Bobby and Jimmy tried to force their way into the house, Emma and Tom could have tried to defend the house together, or Tom could have slipped around the house when Bob and Jim forced entry, got an into his car, and called 911. In the end, one crushed thumb later, and the only person on our death list is Mark, and not even Emma's gonna miss him. I think the intruders from Till Death were beaten. Thanks for watching, and remember, if you manage to knock your attacker out, finish them off. And also remember to check out this video's sponsor and use Nerd55 to get 55% off your first month at Scentbird.